This is your water? Yes. Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad you could uh, join us on this Wednesday afternoon. Lost track of the days. It is Wednesday. So um, we are here to, to celebrate uh, faculty excellence and in the form of the Distinguished Faculty Lecture for Fall 2023. So first, a little bit about this lecture series. It dates back to 1981 when the university inaugurated the Hofstra University Distinguished Faculty Lecture Series to recognize the outstanding talents and accomplishments of our distinguished faculty. For the past 23 years, so since 2000, there have been two lectures per year, one in the fall and one in the spring, focused on scholarly and or pedagogical innovations. This fall's lecture continues that tradition with the focus on public health. As reinforced through Hofstra's strategic visioning exercise two years ago and evidenced by the energy and the creativity of the faculty in last spring's RFP response, community-engaged scholarship is clearly a hallmark of Hofstra University. Indeed, community engagement will take primacy in Hofstra's new strategic plan being developed over this academic year. This afternoon's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Ibrahim Karaye, who is an assistant professor of population health and director of the health science program here in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Uh, Professor Karahi's research focuses on the understanding of health impacts of disasters and mass trauma on socially vulnerable populations, including racial and ethnic minorities and older adults. He also investigates health disparities and the distribution of health outcomes globally within the United States and within the, I should say globally, and within the United States utilizing large secondary data sets and advanced statistical and spatial analytic methods. A nationally recognized physician epidemiologist, Dr. Karaye currently serves and spent last week in DC by serving on the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's committee providing guidance to the White House Council on Environmental Quality regarding equitable resource allocations to vulnerable communities. Dr. Karai has been honored with several prestigious accolades, including the 2020 Publication Award from the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, the 2023 Mentor of the Year Award from Hofstra University, the 2023 Rising Star Award from the Texas A&M School of Public Health Alumni Board. Dr. Karai earned his medical degree from Bayero University in Cano, and holds a master's degree in public health with a specialization in epidemiology, as well as a doctorate in public health with a specialization in epidemiology and environmental health from Texas A&M University. So please join me in welcoming the 61st Distinguished Faculty Lecture, Dr. Karai, whose presentation is entitled, Exploring the Tragic Triad, firearms, opioids, and suicide in the United States, a public health perspective. Thank you for the super kind um, introduction, um, Dr. Riordan. Thank you. OK, so let me um, delve right in. Um, we'll be discussing the um, tragic triad, um, the epidemics of opioids, um, firearms, as well as suicide um, in the United States and um, locally as well. So um, drug overdose deaths um, in the US um, are actually outpacing other public health epidemics. And um, the first segment of my talk would actually be literally me making a case that um, we are dealing with three epidemics here. By epidemics, I actually mean that these are health outcomes that exceed um, what is reasonably expected um, for um, person, place, and time. So the rates at which these diseases, uh, these health outcomes actually occur, uh, outpace in what is reasonably expected. So um, drug overdose deaths in, uh, in the US, um, taking a look at this CDC chart, um, it's, it's quite concerning to see that um, drug overdose deaths uh, have actually overcome um, firearm homicides the peak deaths recorded by firearm homicides per year 
and that of HIV and that of car crashes, right? Um, for example, uh, we see that the peak of firearm homicides was actually recorded in 1993. That was the largest number of deaths recorded um, in that um, for firearm homicides uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, in history, um, and that was recorded in 1993. And in, uh, for HIV, for car crashes, right? So drug overdose deaths had actually superseded um, the rates of deaths attributable to all these major causes of death in the US. Um, as of the time um, this um, figure was published, there was actually 64,000 deaths recorded per year um, in the United States. That was actually in 2016. 2023, we had 96,400 deaths from drug overdose. So we're actually dealing um, with an important public health problem here. Is the United States um, an isolated entity? Um, because in, in, in the end, right, we talk about drug overdose, we talk about firearms, we talk about suicide. I think it's important to contextualize all these health outcomes um, in terms of like uh, geographical distribution, right? Um, so we have the case of the United States. How does it compare with other countries? Um, Observing, kind of inspecting this chart, we could we'll actually see that um, the United States is actually outpacing other countries. Uh, well, Canada, UK, um, Australia, we can see we are actually far up there um, in terms of a drug overdose deaths. What about suicide? A lot of individuals, a lot of people, population, right, um, is actually um, dying by suicide more than ever. Well, we can see that from 1999 to tw 2017, um, there has actually been a reduction in heart disease, in stroke, in cancer um, deaths. But unfortunately, um, suicide um, had actually suicide rate has had actually increased by 35 percent. Um, so it's actually an important public health problem as well. What about firearms? So I thought about this. I, uh, one of those last minute things to do before the presentation. Uh, Alison was so patient with me. Uh, she has had required that I present her my presentation slides by, um, by yesterday, actually. Uh, but um, I presented her a preliminary version of the slide today in the morning with a little caveat that uh, uh, I will continue to make updates until I present. And she, she was so accommodating. Thank you, Alison. So um, one of the things I just did in the last hour was to actually search the, gun, the number of gun deaths um, and injuries actually recorded um, this year. Um, and um, th this got the gun violence archive actually does a lot of uh, good work um, you know, in tracking this data. So in 2023 alone, from January to date, October 11th, um, a total uh, number of um, 33,555 individuals actually died um, from gun violence, uh, from firearms. And um, you can see the numbers stratified by the type of death, either suicide, homicides, mass shootings, mass murders, and what have you. So we are actually dealing with an important uh, public health problem here as well, firearms. What about in the last 72 hours, right? Uh, what I like about the gun violence archive is um, they update it in real time. Like you are able to search the deaths recorded by gun violence, uh, uh, from gun violence, like for today, and you are able to track, uh, to identify when they occurred and uh, read the articles around uh, the, the, the incidents as well. So in the last 72 hours, you could actually see, you know, 229 individuals died um, from firearms. Uh, let me emphasize that um, my personal um, take is the gun violence archive actually underreports the actual number of deaths from firearms in the country. Um, mainly because we know that 60% of deaths from firearms are actually by suicide. And they are, we know that suicides do not usually, um, you know, make it to the news. You know, um, usually the mass shootings do, but surprisingly, or paradoxically, I will say the mass shootings that we all hear about actually constitutes 
about 2% of the firearm deaths. So it's only a tip of the iceberg. Okay, so now what about firearm deaths uh, in the context um, of other countries? How is the United States faring in terms of firearm deaths when we compare? I like this chart in that um, it illustrates visually you know, the number of deaths from firearms um, per one, one million people. And we can see that the United States is there in the bottom, um, uh, 30, um, 30 deaths per million, actually. Um, so outpacing all developed countries, right? Um, truly concerning. Okay, it's important to have some historical context here. Speaking about firearms, I'm actually making a case here that we are dealing with an epidemic. And by epidemic, um, it actually basically means that the rate at which these events occur outpace mm -hmm. what is actually reasonably expected. So but, uh, what was actually the normal? Because uh, we actually need to know to have this some historical context, right? So um, we take a look at this chart. We actually realize that um, there was actually uh, an epidemic of actually firearms in the 1980s that peaked in 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, mm -hmm. that, um, um, that epidemic of firearms then was largely driven by the epidemic of cocaine. So it peaked in 1993. And after 1993, the rates actually plateaued. They leveled out through 2000s. And then after 2000, with uh, deaths from uh, opioids, we are now you know, experiencing another rise um, in firearm deaths. I don't particularly like this chart because it's given this impression that um, the firearm deaths in 2020 actually uh, is, at, at, uh, is at an all-time high. And that could not be 100% correct, mainly because um, the y-axis actually counts the number of deaths. And um, we know that population increases with time. So you do not want to use uh, the number of deaths you know, to be able to assess the distribution over time. right? But at least it gives us an, an idea. I think a better chart could, would actually be this. right? Uh, we'll say the peak is, was still at 1993. But we are actually um, getting there. We are almost outpacing the largest rate ever recorded from firearms. Uh, and these are based on mortality rates, not counts, right? So again, um, US gun violence um, had actually declined after 1990s, plateaued, but the trends are actually rising uh, at a very worsening rate in recent years. So I think I have actually made a case here that we are dealing with three epidemics. Um, a little caveat that this is actually not all inclusive. We also um, have uh, the epidemic of HIV that uh, was uh, about two decades ago, right? And that of obesity as well. But I'm mainly focusing on opioids, firearms, and suicide because they align with my research uh, agenda and philosophy. I joined Hofstra in the fall of 2020. And um, since then, um, I had actually focused more on um, uh, social vulnerability, I would say. Um, prior to that time, I was focusing more on disaster research. So um, speaking about opioids, I thought about this. Um, it's important that um, we assess the, the trends in opioid mortality. Um, in the United States nationally, because we check the literature and we realize that a lot has actually not been done. Um, the more you search, the more you, you realize that um, a lot is actually not known. Um, so we, we assessed opioid mortality trends nationally, but then um, within the state of New York and within, for New York City as well. So um, be because in the end, it's about making impact so this is actually a chart um, that illustrates the um, trends in opioid overdose mortality in the United States. So this is actually a national study uh, based on data from 1999 to 2020. And um, 
the analysis we conducted was was actually called a um, joint point analysis. Um, it, it initially assumes that the trends are actually linear. They do not actually change over time, or they change uniformly over time. I think that would be a better way to actually frame it. But the reality is um, inflection points do exist. You could actually have a rate rise, you know, um, uh, from, for example, 1999 to 2010, and then it plateaus from 2010 to 2012, and then it rises again from 2012. So that is actually the natural occurrence. So uh, with the joint point regression analysis, it actually identifies these trends, um, ultimately, uh, and the inflection points as well. I don't want to get too technical here, but um, what I wanted to point out here is when we see the asterisks um, by the numbers, they actually, they actually denote that, the values there. The increase or the decrease is actually statistically significant. So it's something we could actually infer. Um, if, the, if we don't see this asterisk, it's, it doesn't really matter how large the number is. We consider that it to be kind of a plateau. It's, uh, the, the trend is actually leveling. It's stabilizing. Regardless, when we see a positive number, it's reflecting an increase in trends. When we see a negative number, it's actually reflecting a reduction uh, in trends. So we see that uh, the mortality trends from opioids um, actually um, increased from 1999 to, 20 to, to 2006 by 10.8% per year. It then leveled out from 2006 to 2012 but then from 2012 to 2020, opioid overdose deaths have actually been rising at 13, uh, around 13% 13 per year in the United States. So for the purpose of this study, I'm really going to only focus on the most recent trend because that is the contemporary trend, right, based on the latest data. So opioid overdose mortality is actually rising in recent years based on the latest data released by the CDC by 13% per year. What about for the state of New York? Um, the most recent trend is actually rising at 12.6% per year um, since 2004, actually. What about New York City? The most recent trend in opioid overdose deaths is actually rising um, by about 14.5% per year um, since 2011. I think it's really important that we disaggregate trends because that is what actually distinguishes um, individual health with population health. And um, that was why for the topic, I actually uh, included the population or public health perspective because uh, the, the perspectives are actually very different, right? Um, the clinical perspective is very different from the population health perspective. So um, yes. So for New York City, um, it's actually worsening as well. And the more we uh, disaggregate these trends, the better we know uh, about the public health outcomes, the distribution you know, in the population. So it's important that we, we do, 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 do due diligence um, to assess the disaggregated trends. What about firearms? The most recent trend is actually rising by 3.5% per year uh, in the United States since 2013, based on our uh, study. And this actually aligns very closely with the literature as well. What about um, New York State? I think I have a good news. Um, the trend has actually stabilized um, since 2018 um, for New York State. So um, this is about firearm deaths um, stabilizing since 2018. So. Um, for New York City, it has also stabilized, actually, since 2018, which is really um, you know, uh, a, a positive development. But at the same time, um, we're speaking about population health. Um, it's not, uh, I, sh I share both worlds. Um, I, I, I will say I treat a patient, right? I administer um, fluids, I, I treat them, I administer any drug that should actually be prescribed. I'm actually literally focusing on that patient and his vitals and um, in, the, in the investigation results and how they do. And uh, I, in the end, I infer my judgment based on, you know, I conclude based on the 
the results that I obtained from that patient. But the same does not actually apply uh, to population health. Um, although the trends have actually stabilized in recent years for New York State, which is actually commendable and for New York City, we disaggregate this data by race and ethnicity and we see a different picture. Among non-Hispanic whites, white individuals, uh, the trends have actually been stable actually since 1999. Among uh, non-Hispanic black individuals, we see a rise. In initially, there was actually a decline from 2009 to 2018. But from 2018 to 2020, something actually happened. There was actually a rise by almost 3% per year among non-Hispanic black individuals in uh, New York City. This is based on the firearm deaths. For, non -Hispanic, for Hispanics, uh, I would say the trends have actually been stable uh, since 2018. So again, underscoring the significance of disaggregating data. Um, I want to be as broad as possible with this presentation because we do not have all the time. But if I had all the time, I would have actually given you a more comprehensive analysis of the results by age, by sex, um, by the type of opioid, right? by the geography, Long Island, New York uh, State, uh, the rest of New York State, New York City, and what have you. But again, I'm uh, yeah, just cherry picking, um, uh, selecting a, f a couple of the um, important variables. So, but again, to also further illustrate how complex sometimes the population health um, model or the concept is, we thought ab thought about this. Uh, like, okay, this is actually uh, concerning that non-Hispanic Black individuals are dying at thirty-three percent per year or over thirty percent per year since twenty eighteen. But we also thought about this. What could actually explain uh, this? Um, we thought about COVID-19, 2020. And we could actually uh, derive a lot of you know, plausible, biologically uh, plausible hypothesis by which firearm deaths might increase um, during COVID-19. So we excluded COVID-19 from the data. And we analyzed the data again, and we see a decline in firearm deaths among non-Hispanic black individuals. Telling you that the increase is, was probably due to uh, COVID-19. But before COVID-19, they were actually recording a decline in firearm deaths. So telling you that New York is actually doing something um, positive regarding firearm deaths. Um, for New York State, the same finding, consistent across New York City and New York State. So overall, I feel positive again about firearm deaths um, for the state of New York and for New York City. What do we know about the literature regarding New York? Is New York uh, underperforming in terms of firearm? Um, is it actually doing well? The Giffords, um, is actually a Gif the Giffords Law Center, they do a lot of due diligence in um, tracking um, and grading states in the in, you know in the United States based on how they perform um, uh, you know on firearm deaths um, they um, assess the number of um, laws firearm laws you know enacted per state and uh, how strict these laws are and how potentially effective these laws could be in reducing firearm deaths and they end up you know generating a scorecard so um, uh, it's graded from A to F. So A is the best, F is actually the least. And I'm happy to say that um, New York is actually around um, the A, uh, the A grade. So uh, we, we know that based on the literature. New York is actually one of the safest states in terms of firearm deaths, which closely aligns with, with our finding. Uh, so it's really not surprising. But because firearm research has actually been grossly underfunded um, for years, um, literature is lacking um, on firearm mortality in, for New York State and for the overall country, actually. And um, a New York Safe Act was actually enacted um, in 2013 um, by Governor Cuomo then. And it, there, was a, there were a lot of you know, components uh, to this law. Um, it, it became um, a violation. Um, it was, uh, you know, 
individuals are prohibited from purchasing ma you know magazines with more than seven rounds of am ammunition um, uh, the licensing laws for firearms were made even more stringent and a lot of components to those laws the mental hygi hygiene law was modified so that um, physicians are mandated to report patients to the relevant government agencies um, when they suspect that these patients would actually be of harm to either themselves or to others. Th that is also part of the law as well. And uh, a host of other components uh, to the law. Uh, much of what we could find in the literature based on um, uh, the New York Safe Act were actually narrative articles, uh, you know, opinion articles um, describing the legitimacy of the New York Safe Act on wh or whether or not you know, it violates human rights, right? And the patient-physician uh, relationship confidentiality because he, physicians are mandated to report their patients and that breaches that confidentiality gap. We could not find a single study that was conducted to assess the impact of the New York Safe Act. It was enacted in 2013, 10 years ago in January. So um, we felt this is an important gap in the literature, mainly because states in the United States are left with the um, leverage to, you know, uh, or the discretion to end up um, enacting laws. It's usually a state mandate and not really a, fire, uh, a national. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, the more we know about uh, laws that work, the better, because other states could actually emulate, you know, the evidence, right? So um, with colleagues, um, we embarked on a study. We, an we analyzed this data um, on firearm deaths um, in New York from 1999 through 2020. And um, we found that um, since the I New York Safe Act was actually enacted, there was actually a decline, um, a significant decline by 63% um, in fire um, homicides. So it, overall, firearm deaths have actually reduced. But then again, emphasizing the significance of disaggregating data, we analyzed the data by homicides and firearm suicide. And we realized that the there was actually a significant decline in firearm a homicide by 63% per year. So about 1,697 deaths were actually prevented since 2013 from firearm homicides. But what about firearm suicides? We did not find any significant um, impact uh, or association you know, of, the, of the act and, and that of suicide. I do not want to go into the explanation of you know uh, the graphs and what have you, but again, the concept is we assumed that all the remaining states in the U.S. will serve as controls. So we use a synthetic control approach. It's actually a novel approach uh, to you know compare um, the impact or the association between uh, the the law, uh, the New York Safe Act, and firearm mortality. So that's it about firearms. What about um, suicide? Suicide rates in the United States have actually um, declined since 2018. From 2018 through 2020, uh, there has been a significant reduction in suicide rates. That this is the overall picture. This is what we see overall. Um, we take out 2020 because of COVID-19. And we realize that okay, that the the rates have actually um, increased uh, by 1.97, almost two percent per year, you know, since 2006. Um, so, so with with COVID, right? Um, the, the 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 trends in suicide actually reduced. And uh, I don't do not want to digress, but uh, I will say there were a lot of hypotheses um, around. Um, COVID-19 and suicide. We, we, we all hypothesized that um, suicide rates would actually increase uh, during COVID-19, the, the pandemic. But um, uh, it's so striking to, and comforting to see that um, 
the the sort of increase expected in suicide rates has actually not been recorded. Um, this is one of those studies I wish uh, I had conducted. I have a lot in my list, uh, but 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 I, I will I will say uh, on a cursory review of the literature, I had actually found a couple of studies that have also been published um, explaining this trend um, that. Um, the, the the suicide ha was not actually as expected, uh, which is really good, right, in the other direction. But now, speaking about um, the reduction in, um, or the, the increase in, uh, for example, um, suicide rates, right? Um, I'm focusing on the 1999 to 2020 data. Uh, we include 2020, we see that the overall rates of suicide has actually uh, declined. Commendable. But again, uh, it's important that we disaggregate this data. So we conducted this study. We published it in Preventive Medicine. And it's actually about disaggregating suicide rates in the United States from 1999 through 2020. We disaggregated this rate um, by race and ethnicity. And what we, find, what we found was um, that trends had actually declined uh, by 3.8% per year among non-Hispanic whites um, from 2018 to 2020. However, among non-Hispanic um, black persons, uh, American Indians uh, or Alaska Natives, Hispanics, among um, um, Asians or uh, Pacific Islanders, all the trends in suicide had actually increased consistently across other racial and ethnic subgroups. So we published this paper in 2020. I think as of yesterday, um, uh, it actually got, had uh, 14 citations. Uh, sometimes I'm usually curious. We just, we were just, uh, I was just overhearing the discussion um, Dr. Yod and Charlie was actually having with Kamila about what they do early in the morning. I wanted to chime in, but I was like, okay. I was a little bit nervous because I knew I had to prepare for my presentation. I wasn't in the, but for me, I, I usually reflexly check my phone. Uh, and then it's usually the Google Scholar. I wanted to see whether the citations have improved. And then I go sometimes beyond checking the citations to see in what sort of pub papers have actually cited my work. Uh, these papers advancing the work we have done Right. So, um, interestingly, uh, the 14 citations this paper garnered, garnered actually even um, examined the differences, racial and ethnic disparities in suicide, even more elaborately, which is really an, an important development. So, again, um, that's it about um, suicide, um, firearms, opioids. Um, in uh, the national and state and city context. What about population health? Um, the next uh, phase of this discussion will now center about uh, the significance of the population health perspective. So um, it, it's really important that um, you know population health is actually grounded based on principles um, uh, in the literature. So um, uh, Dr. Catherine Keese and uh, Sandro Galia actually published this book on population health science, and um, they have um, you know, made a case that these are the fundamental principles of population health science. You want to improve population health, you will have to abide by some basic tenets, some basic principles. Because um, uh, population health is not actually an individual health. It's not clinical health. It ha has its own peculiarities. And it's important that you pay attention to these principles. I'm only taking three of these principles uh, and um, discussing them in, 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 in this um, um, lecture. So we have population health manifesting as a uh, continuum. I think it's, it's um, just natural that uh, we naturally kind of like just dichotomize health outcomes. So I, I would bet that when I uh, say firearm, what comes to your mind is you're thinking about individuals that die from firearms and those that 
are not shot and they do not die from firearms or individuals that were shot by firearms and other that were not actually shot by firearms uh, when i say suicide you were thinking about individuals that died by suicide and you are thinking that those that did not die by suicide are actually healthy right um and uh, are not really you know affected by 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 that outcome you know so same with opioid overdose deaths um, you think about that and it's really just thinking about this by, by, by di dichotomy. The reality is uh, population health actually manifests as a continuum. Um, you think about BMI, body mass index. Um, clinical medicine is very different from population health. Um, an individual with a BMI uh, of, for example, um, 31 or could actually be categorized as obese. Um, what about an individual with a 29.9 uh, BMI, right? We, we can make a case in population health that um, these two individuals would have, I mean, as, assuming all other variables uh, remain constant, they should actually have the same complications from population, from uh, obesity, for example. So we, important, we are, it's really important that we recognize uh, the, uh, the that public health uh, or population health actually manifest as a continuum. Why is this important? Because your perception actually determines your uh, actions, right? Your interventions that you end up introducing. So, um, for example, for firearm-related uh, deaths, we always think about mass shootings. We always think about firearm deaths. Um, oblivious of the fact that the firearm deaths only constitute one third um, of, of firearm related violence uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, some individuals, uh, another one third uh, are injured, or others right, are treated, right? So um, it's really important that we do not dichotomize um, population health outcomes. The next principle is actually that of ubiquity. Sometimes we overlook the ubiquitous um, factors or determinants or drivers of disease, and we begin to focus on other factors. So we do not actually want to forget the big picture, right? There is this actually this uh, metaphor of um, the goldfish. Now I have a goldfish. Uh, I, I'm very diligent, very meticulous in ensuring that the goldfish stays healthy. Um, and um, I have it in my aqu aquarium. I, I ensure that I replace um, the food that is needed. I teach the goldfish on how it would actually swim anti-clockwise and remain physically active. Um, I get a goldfish doctor to kind of like, um, you know, see the goldfish mm. periodically to ensure that the vitals are doing well and everything is set. Uh, g giving me the impression that I'm actually doing well and then in the end, I come to my office, I check, I realize that um, my goldfish is dead. I think about the possible causes of death for my goldfish, considering that I have been doing all the due diligence. And I later realized that I had forgotten all this while to change uh, the water within which the goldfish actually resides. So um, it's really important that we think about ubiquitous factors uh, when it comes to population health. So now, in the context of opioids, what's the ubiquitous factor? We think about fentanyl. It's actually a form of synthetic opioid that is currently driving um, deaths from opioids. Uh, so it's not pres pres prescription opioids. It, it used to be prescription opioids in the 90s, but it's no longer prescription opioids. There are three waves of the opioid um, epidemic, right? The first wave was actually prescription opioids in the 90s. From 1999, from 2000 to 2010, it was heroin. After 2010 to date, it's, you know, synthetic opioids, um, especially fentanyl. So as much as we think about other factors that could actually impact drug overdose deaths, opioid overdose deaths, it's important that we do not forget about fentanyl. What about firearms? Um, for firearm deaths, well, the ubiquitous factor is actually guns. 
right? It's actually the gun that is used as as a tool in, initially, right? So, um, as much as we would enact laws, we could we should actually not forget that um, central to all this, uh, you know, detrimental outcomes that we all record in uh, the guns themselves. Unfortunately, the U.S. actually has enough guns to go around. So it's almost one gun per person. In fact, s some studies are reporting more guns than persons in the United States, more guns than individuals. So um, the U.S. actually, uh, United States uh, constitutes about 4% of the world's population, but owns about 50% of the, of the guns in the whole world, right? So, so I think it's really important that we do not forget how ubiquitous guns are in this context. And uh, no wonder, you know, uh, based on the literature, st states that have actually uh, enacted stricter laws tend to observe lower rates of firearm mortality. Um, well Connecticut here, for example, um, tightened their licensing requirement in 1995. They recorded 40% reduction um, you know, in, 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 in firearm homicide and 15% reduction in firearm suicide. Uh, on the other hand, Missouri repealed uh, the licensing requirements and make, made them less strict. And they recorded a 25% increase and 16% increase. So again, we do not actually forget um, the gu guns as being central to this. And um, I like this chart in that it also illustrates uh, the negative association between, or the negative relationship between uh, firearm deaths and number of laws enacted per state. And we see that the higher the number of laws enacted by states, the lower the firearm deaths recorded. What about firearm suicide? So what about suicide? What is actually the, uh, the ubiquitous factor of a suicide? I must attest that a lot is not known about suicide. We still do not know much about what really drives suicide rates. Um, unlike guns, right, um, for suicide, it's actually a lot of factors. It's still un unknown. Um, mental health morbidity uh, accounts for only 50, 50 or 55% of deaths by suicide. And even among those, uh, uh, you know, so it's it's very uh, it's a very gray area, very complicated, right? Um, so identifying the drivers of suicide, uh, a lot of studies are still being conducted to determine what really drives suicide. But this is what I think about this. Um, there are two ways that we could actually approach this. Um, you have um, a high suicide rate um, in, a in a country, for example, in the United States. You either imp uh, kind of I intervene and ensure that the drivers are actually taken care of so that uh, they do not result in higher suicide rates. But that is what we do not know, right? Or you think about this. Um, you think about what individuals use you know, to complete their suicide, and then you intervene. So it's as it's like you have a castle. You could actually um, intervene, th th and there are a lot of routes to that castle. Uh, some individuals could swim to the castle. Some some of indi some individuals could actually fly. Uh, some of, some individuals could walk, or they could crawl to the castle. And one way you could do this is um, prevent them from, get, you know, um, taking the journey to the castle. That could actually be complicated because there could be there is just uh, there is a very num a high large number of determinants there. Another approach could just be to lock up the castle so that nobody actually enters the castle in the first place. You lock it up. So now, why am I actually um, elaborating on this? As far as suicide are concerned, before opioids, right? Um, individuals would use, for example, op uh, uh, other means, right, to co to conduct suicide. And in now, even with opioids, individuals use opioids, you know, uh, to complete suicide. But I think it's important to emphasize that um, the success rate um, for suicide through opioid use is actually less than ten percent. 
So only less than 10 out of 100 individuals that attempt suicide by opioid end up dying by suicide. So 90% do not actually succeed in completing their suicide. But now, with firearms, the success rate is 90%. Individuals attempt suicide um, by firearms, there is a 90% likelihood that they will succeed and they will die uh, by suicide. And another important um, uh, you know, uh, aspect of the literature here is that those individuals, when you take a look at those individuals that do not succeed, think about opioids, for example. Uh, only less than 10% will end up succeeding. So you have this 90% that do not succeed you know, and do not die by opioid suicide, right, by opioid. So um, research has actually shown that of these individuals that do not, are not successful, you know, uh, in completing their suicide, um, only uh, less than 10% end up, you know, dying by suicide, uh, you know, the second time or attempting suicide. Because, you know, what suicide... Uh, her research has shown that it's usually an impulsive decision. Individuals this make this decision in less than 24 hours. They do not succeed. They are unlikely to attempt it again. So now, from the public health perspective, you think about this and then you think about opportunities for intervention. If individuals, uh, the, the return on investment is actually higher if individuals use opioids than use firearms because I'm able to rescue 90% um, and um, get them, in, them into some sort of mental health counseling or other, provide the support they need so that they don't actually die by suicide. Whereas for firearms, I end up losing 90% at a go and I'm only left with 10%. This further underscores the significance in population health of um, taking into account ubiquitous factors, always. Um, that is actually the, 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 uh, that principle. You know, um, again, suicide, we know, accounts for um, more than 60% of deaths from firearms. But you disaggregate this data by age, you'll find that in, in older adults, 92% of them actually die by suicide, which is even more concerning. What about um, principle six? It's actually a principle that highlights the significance of considering co-occurring factors. So in individual health, in medicine, in clinical uh, practice, um, we, we, we always think about one factor that actually causes disease. It's either SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19, or it's, uh, you, you know, um, uh, genetic factors, for example, causing cystic fibrosis, or uh, I, want, I want to have you, right? We, we always think about one factor causing disease. In, in population health, uh, it's really important to consider that um, it's multifaceted. Uh, it's a very complex concept, complex system. A lot of factors um, could actually result in disease. Um, so we have actually the history of Jon Snow, um, who was a legend in public health. There was this um, cholera outbreak back in London. And uh, we always lionize. I always, uh, usually when I teach my epidemiology class, my first lecture is telling the students the story of Jon Snow. And we all hail Jon Snow, you know, we, we are all uh, impressed by what he has actually done. There was this cholera outbreak in London and um, he collected data, he created maps, and then he hypothesized that the cholera outbreak was as a result of um, contamination uh, in a pump handle, the water supply. So he went on and, and he removed the pump handle. and. Um, uh, Voila, things actually just improved, and uh, there was no, uh, the epidemic was actually gone. But that is actually what we tell our students because we are try really trying to, you know, introduce this concept of epidemiology to them. But what I do not actually tell them is that um, actually Jon Snow intervened uh, when the outbreak was already declining there, as you can see. So the outbreak was actually getting better. I think, I mean, things were really improving, and that was 
you know, and then he intervened then, right? Um, why am I actually um, bringing this to our attention? Because uh, this is not to underestimate the significance of the intervention made by Jon Snow, but it's also to bring to light that in population health, if you are really interested in pr improving a population health outcome, you will have to think of multiple factors at the same time. It's really not just um, one intervention. But let me, um, um, you know, contextualize this in the context of, you know, COVID-19, right, um, more recently. So this vaccine was actually introduced um, uh, around early 2021, right? But now we have the benefit of the hindsight to go back and actually observe the data and kind of analyze it, right? Uh, because we have passed through the pandemic and we realize that, wow. So the vaccine was actually introduced at a time when uh, the peak had already been reached. You know, the peak was in, in, in January 2021 and the vaccine actually came later, much later. In fact, when the vaccine came in February 2021, only 6% of um, the US population was actually vaccinated. But again, this is not to say that the vaccine was not important. It was, but other public health interventions, you know, um, the social distancing, the face mask use, you know, the public health education, you know, the social support, um, the fiscal support that were given to families, the mental health support, all, so it's actually a, a kind of complex system. It's not really just, you know, uh, one, um, you know, um, approach. So now, we think about opioids, and I talked about fentanyl, right? But I also wanted us to think about this as a ubiquitous factor, not, the, not the, just the only one isolated factor. And why is that important? Because just recently, we learned that um, xylazine, which has actually been approved by the FDA for veterinary use, is actually now being used to adulterate fentanyl and increase its potency. And just so we know, uh, uh, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than other opioids, especially than heroin. And therefore, uh, about 100 times more deadly. Uh, individuals um, buy other, other drugs and they, then they, they, they don't know that these drugs are actually contaminated um, with fentanyl. But to make matters worse, now fentanyl is even getting contaminated by xylazine, which is even more deadly. And unfortunately, um, the drugs that we use, like naloxone, to uh, to treat individuals, you know, uh, with poisoning or uh, uh, opioid poisoning, will not work um, in 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 such category of patients because again, xylazine is actually not an opioid. Um, again, underscoring the significance of considering multiple factors. Because again, um, if all you think about the world is actually a hammer, then everything begins to look like a nail. So your um, judgment is actually predicated on your perception, your thoughts. And um, it's, that's why it's important to consider co-occurring factors. Again, with mass shootings, it's not only mass shootings, it's, other, it's suicide, it's other factors that would result in death. What about mass shootings in schools, right? Uh, we always observe this, it's, it, they make rounds in the media, we are all concerned about mass shootings. Um, oblivious of the fact that there could also be, like for example, you take about racial and ethnic disparities here, right? 16% um, of schools, uh, almost 17% of um, black students um, uh, attend schools, right? They make up the, they make up the composition of these schools, but twice as much of of these students actually end up um, getting shot, you know, uh, from a firearm. So there is a lot uh, that we really need to unpack and also study. We need to un consider racial and ethnic dif disparities. We need to consider geographical distribution of disease and health outcomes. We need to inco to, to to study sex differences. We just recently published a paper on sex differences and alcohol-related deaths in the United States. Um, so it's really important that you consider co-occurring factors, disaggregate the data 
to get a more holistic view. And that is why the system is actually complex. It's a complex mm -hmm. system with suicide, with everything you could actually think of, think of in the population health perspective. And um, all this, right, um, firearms, suicides, opioids, HIV, we now begin to wonder uh, what, what is actually the impact. You take a look, look at the life expectancy of the United States. You compare that with that of other countries. You realize that the United States actually spends the largest in terms of health care uh, you know, in the overall world, uh, but yet it does not um, perform as much in terms of life expectancy as other countries that do not spend as much as the United States. Truly concerning, but again, going back to the data and really observing historical trends, has this been the occurrence ever since? No. In the 1980s, 30 years ago, um, the United States was actually doing well in terms of life expectancy. It was at, at par with these countries. But something happened after the 1980s that is increasingly uh, making the United States uh, stall in terms of um, you know, life expectancy. Uh, could this be explained by firearms, by, you know, by uh, opioids uh, and, and other epidemics? It's possible. Uh, some studies have been published in this regard, but it's still um, an area of, of, of research. But I think it's really important to uh, consider the population health approach. I will round up my discussion um, by telling you about um, Salome Karwa. Salome Karwa was actually a nurse in Liberia. Um, um, in 2014, she was... Um, infected with Ebola during the Ebola pandemic, uh, sorry, epidemic in Liberia then. And um, she was hospitalized along with other patients uh, um, with Ebola. But she had some kind of something, I would say kind of like legendary with her in terms of like just being selfless. She was on admission, um, and but was still helping others that were sick. and. Um, you know, uh, providing every support that she could do, even though that she was also not feeling well, even though she was also on admission. So um, the Medicine Sans Frontiers, Doctors Without Borders, actually realized, they recognized this with her, and they were like, okay, you know what? We will employ you, considering that you are now um, better. So when she got better, you know, she was discharged, they employed her, because um, she really wanted to help out. Um, she So... Again, um, she, they employed her as a counselor. She did so well. And through her efforts and those, those, those of other healthcare providers, um, Salome actually um, saved thousands of lives from Ebola in Liberia. And, and no wonder she was actually awarded, you know, the co-person time, um, person of the year, the co-person of the year by Times Magazine. And that is actually Sal uh, Salome there, Karwa. pretty commendable. But what happened two years after? Salome was admitted in a hospital in Liberia, her home country, uh, where she, she had actually served. Right? And um, after giving birth, um, she actually had hypertension and she had protein in urine. Um, a very high chance um, that um, she could actually convulse, what we call preeclampsia. She was not treated adequately. There were reports that she had actually been consistently um, worrisome and kind of complaining about how uh, inefficiently she was treated. Um, but she was actually discharged um, uh, home, even with her hypertension and proteinuria, and was taken back to the hospital where she had given birth. But the doctor would not see her because um, she was an Ebola survivor. Um, the physicians then in Liberia actually had this perception that um, and uh, even if someone had actually recovered from Ebola, they could still transmit the disease. They never did, took into account that she had done so well. She had done so well for the community. Um, or considered other factors, but they will not treat her. They will, the physician will not touch her. 
they did everything they could um, and she started convulsing while in the car so now she has developed the full blown eclampsia which was very deadly so she died two years later in 2017 so with Salome we now begin to wonder she had actually survived Ebola but she was also a victim of her circumstance by birth she was actually uh, born from you know in one of those countries uh, one of the countries with the largest maternal mortality rates in the world but she was also a, 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 a victim of discrimination and stigmatization because she had survived Ebola but she was also a victim of an inefficient healthcare system as well in which physicians will not actually use evidence and will just make use conjectures to derive their judgments and will not actually treat a patient because they felt that even with the antibodies they had actually developed, they could still transmit disease. But she was also vulnerable because of her pregnancy. So you could actually think about multiple factors here, from her pregnancy to her geographical location to her social status. I come from Nigeria. I mean, individuals that are even in in, in Southwest, uh, for example, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, individuals that are rich could easily fly out of the country and they get treated. They get the best of care. So she was also a victim of uh, her social status as well. And I can go on and on and talk about co-occurring factors, social determinants of health, especially coming kind of coming from Nigeria and. Uh, uh, you know, being raised in, in, a, in a country uh, that is considered a low resource setting. And um, with this, I actually bring an end to my talk. It's been a pleasure, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ibrahim, for a wonderful presentation. So I had a quick uh, couple of comments and questions. Um, one of them was, and that's the wonderful joy of seeing slides suddenly go fast. Uh, you, meant, you, know, you talked about race, right? So a couple of things in the context of suicide. And, I, and you also talked about gun mortality. I'm wondering how did this intersect with race and gender? Because you said you had some data. And I think one of the slides that you were going to show but decided to skip was that. And I wonder, because when you think about gun mortality, right, does it, and suicide, does it mm -hmm. work equally in terms of gender? Um, and so that's the first one. And the second, you mentioned the Asian um, uh, suicide being higher mm -hmm. during that COVID period among Asian Americans mm -hmm. and gun violence. And uh, you, I, I, could you clarify from your data or your analysis as to what the causal factors were for that? Um, and did that intersect in terms of age? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for the very important um, question. So, um, yeah, speaking about suicide, and sorry, I had to fly through the slides because of the time constraint. Um, yeah, so th sp speaking about suicide, and uh, when you disaggregate this, this data by race, what we know is previously um, the suicide rates are higher among non Hispanic whites. That is what we know um, in previous studies. But recent data is actually showing that uh, other racial and ethnic subgroups, except non-Hispanic white persons, are actually recording uh, an increasing uh, rate of uh, deaths from suicide. But it's also important that I point out that um, we're talking about trends here, not really the burden, because these are two different terms. If you are to estimate the number of individuals that die by suicide, uh, uh, estimated the rates of these individuals, the rate of deaths from suicide, uh, let's say in the past 22 years, you still end up with a higher number, uh, a higher rate among non-Hispanic white persons. But that is also because that incorporates the 
historical data, right? But the trends tell you what is actually happening more recently. And if the trends are sustained in the same direction, there is actually high chance that the burden could actually change. So now, speaking about um, uh, age differences in terms of, uh, I think it's really important that we study suicide rates by age as well. Like um, this paper that we had act we actually published, and I will be happy to go back on that slide I skipped. I, I'm not really sure which slide is the, was that. W was that this one? So with this, with this particular paper on differential trends in US suicide rates, right, published in preventive medicine, we focused on disaggregating the data by race and ethnicity. But uh, it was also a comprehensive analysis. So we disaggregated by, by race and ethnicity, but um, if you are to pull the paper, the article, you will actually see that for every race, we also disaggregated that by age, uh, by, by US census region by mechanism of suicide as well. So it's pretty expensive, um, extensive, I would say. And what we know um, uh, in, in the literature is um, of all the causes of deaths from suicide, uh, a lot are actually dying from firearm suicides. And in terms of age, uh, more individuals, uh, more older adults actually record a higher rate of suicide than younger adults. Um, as for the determinants of Asian suicide, right? Um, speaking about the factors that could actually explain why these trends are occurring. Um, I would like to be transparent with you that our study did not actually examine that. So um, the data, the, the sort of study design was not, the aim was not to identify the drivers of mortality trends, but it was actually a descriptive study because um, almost always you start descriptive, you understand the patterns, and then you delve in further you conduct more rigorous analysis to identify factors that would actually explain these trends. Yes. Um, so um, next, um, I'm wondering, could you, w w could you identify the slides? That I would be happy to elaborate on that. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Oh, absolutely. Like, very important. Yes. Thank you very much. So now, um, in terms of sex differences, that has actually been an area of interest uh, for me as well. And this is probably an avenue for collaboration, actually. So the, um, considering the significance of assessing sex, um, sex differences, the NIH um, had actually uh, recently released a report um, emphasizing the significance of grants and studies to, uh, to, uh, to identify sex as a biological variable because uh, the clinical trials uh, and what have you uh, underrepresent, for example, women and what have you. In fact, that, that was one of the reasons that prompted our study of the sex differences in alcohol-related um, deaths. And um, for firearms, what we know, um, based on the literature, right, is that men are more likely to die uh, from firearm-related deaths um, than women. Um, that is what we know. We currently have a, 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 a kind of a, a study that we had conducted, we, we are yet to publish that paper. It may be published probably early next year. But it's actually about sex differences in firearm mortality trends in the United States. Um, we also have another project on sex differences and opioid-related mortality. Uh, uh, as well. Again, for opioids, for suicide, uh, for opioids, for firearms, we actually see uh, a higher rate of deaths uh, in men compared to women. And there are possible explanations for this as well. Yes, happy to discuss further. Yeah. Yes.
Hi, Ibrahim. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I think that this is something that I've seen parts of these presentations before, but the way that you're able to put it together really paints a disturbing, but you know, um, comprehensive picture of these um, causes of death. Uh, I'm interested, I'm sure that you've heard of the concept of deaths of despair, right? Which is this concept that sort of looks at deaths due to suicide and overdose um, and violence that are, you know, sort of contextualizing them as trends that are happening in particular with white men in their 50s and 60s, right? And, and, that, and that increase that has happened. The bigger point is that this, you know, uh, identification of those, um, of, that, of that trend speaks to the ubiquitous factors that you had identified, right, in terms of thinking about like why then, right, why, you know, uh, in terms of this time in the United States do we see these types, these particular types of deaths increasing. Of course, the availability and you know the 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 lethalness of the of the drugs absolutely contribute to that. But I'm wondering if you could just speak to a little bit more in terms of some of the other um, uh, contextual factors that might be also influencing this that you've sort of come across. And of course, I'm thinking about things like the recession or um, you know there was a, a study that just came out in the, the Washington Post actually that published that looked at um, chronic disease deaths um, and showing how that would how strongly that's associated with socioeconomic status for example and so I guess that's the question is thinking about the context of these types of deaths that you mentioned in terms of some of those ubiquitous factors but that are perhaps a little bit more um, uh, social in nature thank you very much um, uh, for the for the good for the excellent question um, Martin yeah so that's of despair right um, so this is uh, what we know uh, from the literature. Non-Hispanic whites, uh, uh, they actually exhibit this increase in mortality, as Martin had actually said, uh, uh, especially among older adults. Uh, and uh, you begin to wonder why that is the case um, and why that is actually um, associated with these three epidemics. And um, most of what we know, um, Martin, is that um, the the deaths by suicide are usually by firearms, uh, and um, that is in under or kind of overrepresented among non-Hispanic whites, and that could probably be one of the factors that could actually explain this. But again, not to also overlook other social factors, as you were actually saying, um, income, for example, um, the recession, and and, and and other contextual factors. Um, uh, the literature has actually extensively uh, studied this, but most of what I do is actually uh, disaggregating this by socio-demographic variables rather than economic variables. Yeah, but but I would say it's actually complicated. It's a complex system, and um, the more we study, the more we realize we do not know, right? And um, yes, for example. Uh, I just recently received received a review, uh, peer review, and uh, the the peer reviewers were recommending that we also consider the place of death, especially when it comes to opioids, which is really an important uh, contribution as well, because where an individual dies also tells you a lot about how they died, right? Uh, was it as a result of isolation? Was it actually on admission? Tells you a lot about that. So um, yeah, so the, the the economic aspect or the kind of social and contextual factors, I, I think it's really important that we take them into consideration, um, and probably in future studies. Um, yeah, but uh, it's something I do not really uh, consider, but I will begin to consider those as well. Thank you. No, I was going to ask the last question. So to ask the last question, I need to give it to you to ask the second to last question. Okay. Thank you. I'll make it quick. Um, uh, thank you for this very instructive lecture, Ibrahim. I'm thinking a lot of policy responses and kind of the challenges of addressing drugs, guns, suicide, when there are such strong trends in the United States toward limited federal of limited role for the federal government and then even at the state level much stronger uh, much stronger push for private versus public sector right and so i'm just wondering if you would share your thoughts on 
what might be one or two feasible policy approaches, whether national or state, that might be able to begin to address to try to reverse some of these trends? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this important question, right? So it, it's really complicated, right? Especially when it comes to the politics and uh, also ensuring that these policies do not actually violate, right? Um, the rights of the people, and that is where, where it uh, even gets even more complicated because there is a fine line um, between enacting a policy to serve people and then um, depriving individuals of all the population of their rights. Uh, partly, uh, that probably explains some uh, of the complexities of all this and uh, probably why other countries are, uh, you know, faring much better than the US. Um, yeah, it's really a very gray area. Now, as far as firearm is actually concerned, firearm deaths, firearm violence, um, states are usually left with the discretion to enact these laws. And um, what we know is states that have actually uh, uh, number one, in terms of policies that work, it's usually a combination of policies and not only one particular law, for example. There is uh, the red flag law in which uh, an individual has a criminal history, right, and then they are, uh, you know, um, you know, a, a prevented or kind of like, um, they are not uh, permitted to purchase a firearm. Um, there, there are... Um, licensing laws and what have you and, and kind of other laws right so it's a combination of these laws that would ultimately re reduce uh, or that re would ultimately result in a reduction in firearm uh, mortality or firearm injuries so a uh, pl plausible approach is actually um, to consider states that are actually doing well right see what policies they have actually enacted because again, we have states that are really doing well, and these are the states I had actually shown on the Gifford score. Like Massachusetts, it do, I think it's actually number one. It's doing amazingly well. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire, New York, right? We can closely look at um, the policies enacted in these states, and then we emulate them. Uh, so, so other states not doing so well could actually you know, uh, mirror all the sort of like policies and, and see if that actually works. That is just going by the evidence um, that we know, right? So what about um, opioids? Um, how do we go about that? Well, um, in my humble opinion, you think about opioid, you think about the synthetic opioids specifically that are making their way into the illicit drug market, right? So, um, and the, the big question is here, um, what measures could actually be taken be besides uh, other, for example, you know, um, policies that would uh, amount to improving the um, the resource? Like the executive order was actually, you know, enacted. Uh, opioid was um, identified as an epidemic, you know, in 2017, and that came with an increase in resources and what. Besides that, and thinking about the larger factor, right? Um, how do we prevent this illicit drugs um, from reaching the United States? And what we know in the literature is there are two major cartels, right? For example, in New Mexico, uh, as far as so not New Mexico, in Mexico, for example, and these are the major cartels that are actually are driving most of the opioid-related fatalities in the United States. And these cartels are well known. So how do we now um, in in enact policies? How do we work with uh, our neighboring countries, for example, to ensure that those uh, illicit drugs uh, do not actually make it to the US? I think that would actually be uh, an opportunity. I think that it will be an area to enact a policy without really offending people. But um, what I like about the, the principles of population health um, outlined by Dr. Keith and Sandro, one of those, is actually that you intervene, there is actually a high chance that um, you could also do harm. It could be, uh, you know, in terms of like well 
just you know um, perception, for example, or beliefs, right? So uh, on the population health perspective will actually have to be radical, right? So sometimes um, it's actually a tough love. Like um, you keep, uh, you know, you enact those policies, right, that are for the betterment of the overall good, um, even if that comes at a price, right, um, and even if that brushes off wrongly with, you know, a lot of people feel wrongly about it, but um, I really don't don't want to emphasize much. As you will see, I don't I do not have a political background uh, as a physician epidemiologist. So I, I would say, um, yeah, uh, the politicians will actually have to do a lot more uh, in ensuring that um, these epidemics are mitigated as, as needed. Yes, thank you very much. So I'll short circuit my question because it was really about that intersection of public policy and population health. Yes. But I will say in all of my adult life, which goes back to being in high school when, when Reagan and Press Secretary Brady were shot and the, the gun violence issue, I've never seen the plot that you showed from the Giffords with respect to, to uh, the impact of really the weight of laws on on death by um, by guns, so I thought that was quite interesting. And then I guess the question that I was going to ask, but I won't ask for the sake of t well, I'll ask, but you can answer it later for the sake of time, is that um, I was also struck in that population health sort of policy, mm -hmm. looking at some of these plots over time and the ups and downs with respect to um, uh, gun violence and gun death by uh, gun deaths. You know, intuitively, you can overlay things like the Violence Against Women Act and the lack of reauthorization of the, the assault rifles ban. Um, and so the question would be, how does one go from correlation to causation? Yeah. And I, I think that, that's Thank probably you. a pretty unfair question to ask at this hour that is a methodological question. So yeah. we'll leave it for that. I'm, I'm going to follow up with him, but please join me in thanking Ibrahim for a great lecture. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you.